Hey, hey. Welcome, welcome. We're going to let folks uh, join the first few minutes here, and then we'll get started. Oh, let's see. All right. Phone is at 42%. We'll see if we make it. We might have to run back to the office. It's a beautiful day out, so change the scenery uh, for the live. And we can walk around on the farm if anybody has questions or if we need to see something, something like that. If you could leave a comment and let me know that the audio is working okay, that would be great. Last time I think it was all right, just want to double check. Always want to make sure that audio and whatnot are okay. get things started in just a moment usually about three or four after we'll get rolling let folks join people might be meeting hopping coming in from working on something hey Kelly welcome welcome Joan, audio is good here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Good, good. Thank you. I decided to take some of the trays that were actually back there. You see that blank spot? Now I moved them up here so we can wash them, and they're kind of blocking my view. But not all of it. I got a little strip of nice greenery out there. Hopefully you guys have a good view where you're at. If you guys have questions or are thinking about anything, feel free to throw those in the in the comments. Um, this one was set up as a classroom as well, so if anybody wants to jump on uh, video, audio, um, we can go ahead and try to make that happen. I've never done that yet before with the classroom, so uh, we still need somebody to test that out with me, but uh, we'll get there. No pressure, anybody. <clears throat> it's just a casual conversation today about mealworms and whatever else is going on in the insect farms. All right, let's do a time check again here. 2.33. We'll get rolling here in just a moment. It's starting to get a little humid. So I just want to make sure we got everything squared away. It's good to know that that works though. All right, well, let's get rolling for the day. Um, so we uh, we moved in here a couple weeks ago and we're still getting things squared away. It's like a whole new adventure. Um, trying to figure out temperatures and where to put fans and what the impacts are. Um, so I'm kind of having to go back through the basics, which is fun on uh, its own way. Um, but we're finding that we're needing to ramp up production and do a little bit of change to that. Uh, Joan, what do you got here? I've got a vibration platform, but looking for systems to strap filters on. Thanks. So like the, the green, are you talking about the green uh, filters? Or the green... Um, uh, sifting pans or some sort of sifting pan so that you can connect it to that uh, vibration platform Yes, okay, let's go mobile follow me. I'm gonna leave my drink here my fancy sparkling water all right, so we're going to go back into the farm. Uh, Ben's not here yet, so nobody's working on anything, so there's no dust particulates or anything like that, um, which is good. So I don't need to put my mask on. I am going to turn this one fan off that's over by us. So let me get this set up. That is my vibration platform, okay? And then what my platform has um, is on the bottom, there's a nice sturdy spot here. I actually had to, to drill my own hole in this to put 
uh, this strap on, okay? And so I've got one of those on both sides, and all it does is it connects into this Rubbermaid tote here uh, with the lid on it, strapped on with the handle. So you want to get one that has a handle, right? So you can strap it down. Um, and what that allows you to do is, as this thing fills up, it's uh, right here right now, but as this fills up, these just un you undo these, unwrap them. Uh, if you get a shorter one, that was the one thing that uh, I did wrong in the first place was I didn't get a shorter strap. So we've got to wrap it around there a few times, but um, it's working so far. Uh, you undo that strap, and then you can pop the lid open, take this off. This is not like taped or Velcroed or anything. It's nice and sturdy still with just two of these, one on each side. And then what I did for the top, so um, in the sifting set that I bought, there was a really large uh, uh, mesh in there. And I don't use this for anything actively from a mealworm farming production perspective in the sense of like, this is too big for beetles, it's too big for pupa, it's too big for anything that I'm doing right now. So I used it to connect, I, I cut a hole in the top of the lid, and then I just uh, screwed in some screws here, just every so often, to kind of tighten that to the lid. So it's, it's removable, you know, I could caulk this if I wanted to, uh, but this is a nice good seal, I did measure and, you know, measure twice, twice, cut once, that sort of thing, um, to make sure that no mealworms are getting through there. Uh, but it's nice and secure, and then that way, this thing is good and ready, and then we put our sifting pan pans right on top. So I'll put a couple on there. We do that, and then we're good to go. Now what I've found is, if you go higher than three, so one being um, this guy, uh, he doesn't count. Sorry, guy. Um, if you go higher than three, what I've found is this thing shakes back and forth so much that these guys actually kind of start moving. If you have to go that high for some reason, just take another strap and go from handle over the top over to the other handle. That's why these handles are so handy. Um, but that's just a quick and easy way. Uh, I've also seen, like I know Max has done this before, a similar setup, and he's got Velcro on the bottom. He got some sort of uh, really strong Velcro that connected to uh, the bottom of his bit uh, bucket as well as the top of his vib vibration plate and accomplishes the same thing, right? So he's shaking and, and then he can remove it as he needs to. Um, but this guy has worked really well for us. It's a standard, simple vibra vibration exercise plate, believe it or not. Um, and it's remote controlled. And I'll tell you, the, the first one that we used, we did not have a remote on. Um, and so I had to constantly move this thing around. And what I found, because the controls are on the top of these, what I found is that when this gets heavy enough, it actually starts messing with the controls. So the remote's a really good option. Um, it, it came in handy. I think the one, it might have been like $5 more um, for, for the remote. I would definitely try to get the remote if you could. Um, but that's the way that I've attached it here. Um, hopefully that gives you some, some ideas. Um, and then we just use, I want to say most of the time we're using two uh, two of these filters, one for the, the separation of the larger, right? The pupa, the large worms, the beetles, um, and then one for the frass, which is this little guy. Every now and then we use kind of a middle one to catch some of the chitin. If we have some really heavy uh, harvesting that has a lot of chitin in it, um, we'll use this guy as sort of a, a separation from the frass at the bottom and the chitin. That just helps things go a little faster. Uh, if there's no chitin, though, um, or very little of it, then we usually just do two, and that way we don't have to mess with the middle one. So hopefully that helps. I'm going to turn that fan back on because it is moving air around in here, keeping the temperature stable and whatnot. All right. Uh, I think that's the only the second uh, vibration machine we've had to buy. Um, they last a really long time. They're, they're pretty durable. Um, and I think it was less than $100. Uh, so it's a good way to kind of get into it once you've got production at a level it needs to be to warrant doing some of that uh, uh, very manual shaking work. Just having that plate go back and forth works really well. All right. As you guys have more questions, please throw them in there. Leave comments. Really excited for everybody to be here today. Da, da, da. All right, a little bit more stable there than me walking around. It is getting a little humid. So some of the 
some of the sweat glands are going to start working. Um, I'm looking at my whiteboard. Uh, I posted on that a couple days ago. Maybe it was late last week. Uh, all the things that we've got to do here. Um, and then I started making a calendar. So uh, all we've been doing up until now is a lot of just verbal communication between myself, Ben, and Leo uh, as far as what needs to be done when. And now, we're, since we're expanded, uh, we've got a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and we want to make sure we're communicating it well and plan, planning it out well. Uh, it's also uh, prime growing season here in central Missouri. And so Ben's got a really, uh, really big um, uh, grow operation uh, for vegetables. Uh, he serves uh, and sells at the farmer's market. So he's really, really busy right now. Uh, and so we're going to uh, build out a calendar, basically, um, for uh, the tasks that we have uh, to do each week. Um, and basically owners so we know who's doing what when uh, and what I think we're gonna wind up with is a very routine from like a hydration perspective three times a week uh, for the mealworms and supers um, for beetle collection two times a week uh, I think we'll build a really interesting cadence there um, that could just be a, a, a sort of a template uh, for folks that um, are wondering you know what how much work is actually involved in all this stuff um, because the beetle collection, you're doing that whether you're small scale, um, micro, mini, large, whatever your term is going to be for yourself, um, you're going to need to do a lot of these tasks. And the reason we're doing those um, at certain intervals is for consistency um, and for making sure that <clears throat> we can uh, keep those um, insects as healthy as possible. So... Joan, I hope you were still on there when I walked through that. If not, if any of that cut out or anything, uh, we did have um, some some uh, technical issues with the last one uh, during the actual live. But um, somebody dropped some really good feedback later that they said that uh, the recording was okay. So uh, that's the other thing is Facebook's going to automatically post this um, to uh, to the group, and we can go back and watch them, see them. You guys can go back through and. Um, you know, take a closer look at any of those things that I've been mentioning. Uh, and if any of that broke up for any reason, um, then uh, the recording will have it all. Drew! Drew's in the house. All good here. Awesome. You mentioned the frass market with the cannabis growers. Are there any articles out there? Um, articles pertaining to what? What I mean by that is, I don't know if I've seen any good... Um, study like case literature on uh, the impacts of frass and cannabis it's a lot of a lot of almost hearsay from growers um and so i i haven't personally spent time researching it you know like google scholar is an awesome place that's where i actually found a lot of the mealworm information um from a scientific perspective um but i haven't looked at the cannabis and the frass piece yet um but there are some good studies i know for things like tomatoes uh, there was a farm out in Nebraska, uh, a mealworm farm, that worked with, might have been the University of Nebraska, maybe University of Lincoln, something out there near them. Uh, and they did a grow test on tomatoes, and they published that. Um, so that there are publications out there for frass and for, um, you know, tomatoes, um, for different growing uh, situations, compost teas, foliar sprays. There's... Uh, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of like dot connecting between those things that are very well documented potentially or published at least in a very scientific perspective to then translate that to somebody who, you know, what's your regimen going to need to be for foliar spray on your tomatoes? Um, and so I'm, what I'm going to try to do this summer um, with the new building here, we are literally 20 steps away from an organic farm. Uh, that's raising um, vegetables and so we're going to try to build a, a schedule out for you know a, a once a week foliar spray um, with like nothing in the premix nothing in the in the actual you know the plant has not been exposed to frass until we spray it with uh, the foliar spray and we just kind of want to tinker with it and get familiar with it ourselves and then see you know, in a real world application, because we're not going to, you know, enclose it or, or make it a laboratory type scenario. Um, but, uh, 
we're going to try to see like what does one row of tomatoes produce uh, that is getting those uh, this foliar spray versus one that isn't and, and try to do that. Um, what I found is that people are much more connected to what you're trying to, to tell them and sell them eventually uh, if you've got some really good personal experience with it. So I'm not a gardener at heart. Uh, but we actually just started a garden this year. We tried a few years ago, and it's just been a time thing with family. We haven't had much uh, time for that, but we'll get rolling, and uh, I'll probably post some of that in the future. Since insect farming is still growing in USA, there's not much articles of fresh beans. Yep. And the other thing is, even if they are using it, if those commercial growers are using it, they're not going to talk about it. Uh, they don't want anyone to know what they're doing. Uh, the cannabis world very much reminds me of the mealworm world or the insect world from a knowledge perspective. The people that have the knowledge are going to keep it because they're talking about, you know, like million dollar operations, right? And so the, they're, yeah, trade secrets, exactly. Um, so they're going to be keeping that close to the chest. Um, but I think as, you know, as time goes on, uh, one with technology, things like this, um, but the, the expanding uh, options, right? Like Facebook's been around for a while, but you've got TikTok now, Instagram, you know, everything goes through ebbs and flows. And now we've got a really good way with TikTok of throwing out 15 second, hey, here's what I do with my compost tea, just to get people interested, just to get them, you know, some, some knowledge out there. Um, and with the cannabis market expanding, uh, one into medical and then two into recreational, um, you're going to start seeing a lot more people growing at home. And then the, the you know, knowledge is going to start to spread from a homegrown perspective. So that is how they stay on top of the market, yes. Does North America have an insect coalition? Uh, there's a, oh, what's it called? Someone started it. Um, I can't remember what it's called. There, there was a company uh, out in Colorado, and they... They shut down their insect business, but they continued with the insect farming. I want to say coalition might have been in their name. Um, not that I'm aware of other than USDA agriculture. Isn't there, um, th there was a, a company on Colorado that was raising mealworms for human consumption. Um, that They were doing it in a shipping container. They had decked out the shipping container. Um, and they were raising it for chefs in the local area. Uh, and then... The person that helped found that moved into, oh man, what is her name? Wendy? I'd have to look at that. If I leave the screen here, it's going to um, to boot me. Um, I can just walk into my office and look at my laptop or my desktop. Um, they started something, and it was for North America or the U.S. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. I got the air purifier on. I'll turn that off in a second. Let me just put this here and get the computer fired up. Europe and stuff has a big insect. Yes, Europe's already got theirs going. Um, and it's very much geared towards the edible, edible insects. You guys are way ahead of us over there, Paul. Okay. Let me get over to LinkedIn. And now that I think about it, she may have left her position and moved into oh, something different. NACIA? No, no, no. North American Code. Yes. Beat me to the punch. I love it. Okay, so what is the. I'm trying to remember the lady's name. Yes, North American Coalition for Insect Agriculture. That's what I was thinking of. So they started a while ago. <clears throat> They're still, it says they were founded in 2016. That seems old to me. Like too old. Fifty stakeholders in the insect food and feed industry met. Yeah. That's them. So they, uh, North American Coalition for Insect Agriculture. So I'm not a member of that. Um, I do follow them on LinkedIn just to, to uh, you know, kind of stay in the know. Um, they put on a conference every year, I believe. Um, but they're, yeah, they're still, 
kind of putting things together and getting their stuff squared away. But that would be a, an interesting one to keep an eye on. Um, I think that was Joan that asked that, yeah. Paul, good to see you out there. I enjoyed the video uh, of the mealworms. Thank you for that. I'm going to have to plug in, which is okay. Slight pause as I plug in. Don't want things to die. And of course, it's going to give me fits. It'd be really, really cool if Facebook would just do that for me. Auto cut out all my glitches. Um, I'm going to start looking at ethical treatment of insects. Yeah, that'll be interesting. We're not even close to that here. It's going to get into the feed market first. That's the, I know Beta Hatch, which is out on the West Coast, they're really big into uh, getting insects into the ag business. Their focus is uh, mealworms. They, um, I think they started, good to meet you too. Um, I think Beta Hatch started selling their dried mealworms under chubby mealworms. I want to say some of chubby mealworms um, are now U.S. raised dried uh, mealworms, which is pretty cool. Um, they were pretty costly, but they, they're they U.S. based, uh, which is awesome. So um, Beta Hatch is definitely going into the feed industry. Their target is things like cattle, poultry, um, pigs, things like that to get the mealworm into a feed. So, so far as America goes, there's not most insect farmers of us are starting to follow your pink guidelines as a standard so that we are on the same playing field when we get to ours together. Yes, yes, the Seymour. Yep. 100% uh, true. Um, and there, it's funny because when I, I've been doing the business officially since 2017 and one of the things I wanted to do uh, is raise uh, insects for human consumption. And when I reached out to my local authorities from like the health department and things like that, um, if I was raising... Uh, let's say I had a vegetable garden and I want to sell that garden at a farmer's market. I can do that. It's not a processed food. Uh, I just pick it, you know, wash it, maybe not, whatever those, those hygienic standards are, um, and then take it to the market and sell it. If I process it though, so if I take that, there are certain exemptions. Um, there are certain things, you know, like I can bake a pie and take it and as long as I label it as made in my home oven, I can sell it. But if you go beyond that, even at a farmer's market, you have to be inspected by the health department and have, you know, follow the proper code and procedures and things like that. And when I reached out to them about doing mealworms, they had no idea what I was talking about. And so the market hasn't pushed the government yet to get their folks up to speed on what any of those standards are. And so, um, like Drew mentioned, people are are following what's happening over in Europe because you guys are light years ahead of us over there Paul I think I participate this time in chat last video wouldn't allow me so I just lurked yes yeah, so we can see you Max good to see you here we got your comment there the moment you package it there's USDA guidelines yes um, one of the things that I was curious about is taking the live insects to a commercial kitchen so the commercial kitchen is certified with the health department and then what, um, and I'm basing this off of uh, my, my good friend who um, processes uh, sauerkraut. He makes cold fermented sauerkraut. Um, so he just takes his stuff there and then he has to demonstrate his procedures uh, to show that, you know, he washes his hands before he does this and all of his containers are cleansed and sterile, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm wondering if taking the live insect uh, to a commercial kitchen and then processing it would be okay that's probably what i would look into um because the having to have all the kitchen equipment and all the you know the packaging and the guidelines all that stuff that's a that's a lot that's a lot paul in the U uk insects for the pet food and human consumption is heavily regulated we had to get a license for processing our mealworms even for so insect regulation in europe is actually twice as strictly more difficult than the regulations required to process food Interesting. Huh. I 
wonder why that is. Just because it's an unknown? Like it's a newish thing? Maybe? I don't know. I don't know. All right, we're gonna unhook. I just gotta let this sit. So it's not shaking around on you guys. All right, and from my perspective, uh, I can see my head above the comments, so I'm, that's why I'm trying to stay up here. Um, hopefully that's working for you guys over there as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know any long-term studies so far that'll affect humans long-term. The start of the food chain. Yeah, it's that's a good point, Drew. I mean, it's from a current world perspective, uh, insects are a fairly new topic, but people have been eating insects for a long, long time. Long, long, long time. But no one was around to actually check and see, was it good, was it bad, what was it doing? Exotic pets, no regulation. Oh, interesting. Other countries have eaten them forever, but there's no actual scientific. Right, yeah, the, the the actual impact to whether they're positive or negative, right? Absolutely. It'll be interesting to see how how some of that starts to pan out in the U.S. Um, as the bigger corporations. Uh, start uh, spreading their influence a bit more to try to get things to work for them and for others. So, all right. Anybody have any any questions? Um, good topic. I'm not trying to end, end the conversation. Just trying to, to reset everybody. Um, for those of you that might have joined after the original intro, we're just hanging out, chatting mealworms. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm one of the admins, um, helping to, to keep building on top of what Mac started uh, for us all a long time ago. Um, and I'm in the in a new facility here uh, on mobile. So if anybody has any questions, uh, somebody asked earlier about the the sifting machine, um, like how to connect and attach it. So I just took a little walk over there to show Joan what that looked like. Um, if you guys have any questions, throw them out there. Anyone ever consider doing internships? I looked into it. A while ago and it was actually fairly complicated oddly enough um, as far as like regulations and whatnot uh, it's not something to go into lightly but I don't know if anybody else has any experience uh, with that uh, that's a good point um, Belazar I hope I'm saying that right um, so for me, US, U.S. and Europe are afraid from Asian market and uh, all regulations are stop procedure for import. So, uh, yes, the um, like from a small business perspective, from my perspective, one of the things I struggled with uh, is the market for dried mealworms. Right. So as I produce more me more mealworms than I can sell, uh, I would love for that to happen. I'm still waiting. Uh, but at some point that could occur. Uh, my intention is to dehydrate them and then have them shelf stable and able to sell in, in, uh, to the folks that want them. The problem is that the prices are so low from imported uh, that it's difficult to compete with that. So it's, it's uh, going to be an interesting scenario, uh, especially with everything going on globally in general, um, how, how that's going to start happening. But I think that as the regulations are more defined uh, and, and the use cases for those things start getting more defined. Like if you are going to start using dehydrated mealworms uh, for um, a food additive, uh, let's say you're making a protein shake or a cheeseburger, you know, the meat patty. Um, if your intention is to use that for uh, human consumption, then the dehydrated mealworms you get are going to probably need to be a, a different type um, of quality potentially than if you were just going to feed them to uh, birds outside, that sort of thing. Uh, Tammy, I want to see it. I missed that. Oh, um, yes, we can, we can do that. We've got 30 more minutes left, so I can take a quick walk in there. Um, give me just a second. It's not easy getting a college internship, so it's not commercially regulated yet. I'm interested in considering an intern, that's why I ask. 
Um, yeah, it's when I looked into it, Max. Um, depending on paid or unpaid, uh, then there are different regulations there. Um, it almost seemed like it was easier at the time for me to hire them as a as a part time employee and pay them minimum wage versus the uh, the internship route um, and the potential paperwork required for that, um, but also just the the uh, labor regulations uh, and that's going to vary, right? So Missouri um, at the time this was like four years ago I think I looked into it um, and it, it just ended up not being something I was going to pursue. All right, Tammy, we're going to take a quick walk. It's going to get a little shaky, everybody. Woo! We're going to go head into uh, the insect room. I don't think Ben is here yet, so I'm going to have to put my mask on. And it'll still be generally quiet. Yeah. Let me uh, turn off this fan. Um, the other thing is you can also go watch the recording at the beginning. But... Uh, Basically, it was this. So Tammy had asked, um, or not Tammy, sorry, Joan had asked earlier about connecting um, a, you know, a, a, the sifters to the, sh the shaker. And uh, this was um, built off of uh, Max's idea. Uh, Max, I mentioned how you had Velcro uh, at one time, uh, maybe some straps on it as well. But what I did, Tammy, is I've got um, a hook down there. I did have to drill a hole in the bottom in the base of my vibration machine uh, and then just get a container with handles so that you can strap it down um, and one of those on both sides and then i took the the sifting set that i bought had this really large mesh right this which isn't used for anything um, from a mealworm farming perspective so i used it to attach there's just some screws here to basically pinch this thing in and then it allows for me to set my sifters on there uh, that i need to uh, and what i found is three is a good level um, if you go higher than this or sometimes when this thing is is fully empty and you're shaking really hard like if you accidentally hit you know 70 percent uh, instead of 50 or 30 we usually run at about 30 um, that's that sifts it really well 30 percent of uh, back and forth um, if you go higher then these things will shake around if you need to for some reason you can strap uh, you know, just a bungee cord across the top. Um, but that works really well. This, is, this isn't this is sealed, uh, so I can remove it and take it off if I need to. Um, and the mealworms so far are not able to get through there because um, it's pinched in. Uh, and this was a cutout that I did based on you know, just measuring and, and whatnot. So hopefully that helps. Uh, any other questions, just toss them out there. Um, we are in the new farm, by the way. So... Kind of a mess, there's the construction zone. I got one more table, I'm gonna build uh, a table basically exactly like this, uh, slightly different um, to do shipping stuff. Uh, and it's gonna be over in the corner here and have other things on it. So that's instead of the buckets, that's, yes. So instead of having the five gallon bucket, so these guys are just those green sifters. They sit inside of a five gallon bucket, right? So you can just sit them in the bucket and then manually shake it back and forth. Nothing wrong with that. Um, it, it, once you have the volume where you've got, I don't know, Max, what do you think? Like 20, 30 trays, maybe 40. Maybe it's more of a tolerance of, uh, you know, f physically having to shake stuff back and forth. Um, grab one of these vibration machines. Uh, what I will say is they get a little bit more dusty. Um, so you definitely, definitely want to have a mask on when we're using this thing. Um, but these uh, are just human exercise vibration plates. Believe it or not, uh, that's what they're sold as. Um, I got mine off of eBay, I want to say, for like 80 or 90 bucks about two or three years ago. Um, and so they just shape, shake back and forth um, very, you know, lightly up to uh, a whole lot. So... Um, yeah, that's instead of the buckets. And then it fills this container. Um, and, and, you know, this is still a fairly manual process because once this, we're halfway full here, once this thing's all the way full, we have to unstrap it. Then we take this and empty it into a bigger container and then bring it back and strap it. Um, ultimately, what I'll build out is something that sifts the frass uh, down into a container. And then my theory is to use a vacuum to suck it up uh, into a much higher frass dispenser um, automatically so that we don't have to move move things constantly. So, all right, let's sit outside for a little bit. 
If you guys have any questions, let me know. If anybody wants to come on camera, we can do that too. Hopefully that doesn't fall. I use two buckets and have a box around them to keep them from coming off. Some same human shaker, yes. Yes, um, and that works perfectly fine, right? I mean, uh, depending on what your your um, needs are, if your farm is working and producing what you need it to, stay with that because one, it's a physical workout, right? You're physically doing things, you're burning calories, you're you're moving your body, which is good. Um, and two, it's it's you know another link in the chain. Like if that thing breaks, if that exercise machine breaks. Having to, for me, having to sift all that stuff is going to be a huge pain um, to do it manually. So uh, that's one of the things that um, is actually on my to-do list is to build a backup um, plan basically for things uh, as we progress so that maybe I get one of those and just have it handy and sitting around. Max, I put a bucket in the hole so I can empty the bucket instead of the bin. <laughs> yeah, 20 minutes of sift time would benefit greatly with this setup. Good deal. I'm not doing any of the exercise machine, sorry. <laughs> That's fair enough, fair enough. It seems crazy to me that those things are built as exercise machines, but I honestly have never tried them for actual exercising. I just got it to do the mealwork stuff. You're up to six in your room? That's uh, a ton. That is a ton. Um, Max, I'm actually looking at... I talked with a... Um, uh, metal worker. Uh, he's a really good friend of mine and he runs his own consulting construction uh, from for where um, uh, engineering uh, designing stuff and so uh, He and I walked through a couple ideas to build out a sifting machine that'll be US based and uh, uh, Usable like the, the sifting grates are going to be um, Able to be pulled out and put different sizes in so I can do different insects um, and then ideally uh, they stack on top of each other. Um, I saw one on Instagram recently that uh, somebody had built um, that was very similar and they had built like a zigzag pattern, right? Where it goes this way and then at the end of that, the insects go back this way. So you've got a compact design basically, um, which is going to be really, really slick. So I'm going to do some trial and test with a wooden option uh, and then do a mock-up with some metal. It'll be pretty interesting. Yeah, Max has got a big operation. Go watch um Max, do you still have the the tour uh, of your um, place online, both the old one and the new one? Um, I remember, I still remember the old one, and you walking around in all the rooms in there and just thinking, holy cow, that's awesome. And the potato slicer. I distinctly remember the potato slicer and thinking, oh my gosh, how many potatoes are you going through in a day? And the poor person that has to crank those things, right? All right, how are we doing on time? I don't want to steal too much from you guys. Another 20 minutes. We're doing good. We're doing good. Whew. Yeah, this morning I worked on just a couple odds and ends uh, in the farm. Um, speaking of the potato slicer, I had to get mine mounted. Uh, I mounted it so that it's, um, it's on a swivel. It's on a door hinge so I can slide it away. Uh, and then today I, I added a hinge or a... Uh, uh, clasp to it so that when it opens I can lock it in place so it stays there instead of wobbling all around so just little things like that uh, did some washing using a new power washer electric power washer uh, I wanted to stay away from gas because I don't have any other gas equipment here so I didn't want to keep gas here just for a power washer so I did get an electric one uh, and it works just fine so now we'll be able to to uh, power wash the trays and in this case it was a, an old wire shelf from the old farm that just need to be rinsed off. Um, but we also don't have running water here, so I filled up a 55 gallon drum, uh, hooked up the power washer to that, and away we go. Paul, the pharmaceutical industry has some good sifting machines to get ideas from. Yes, um, and the, uh, the guy that I talked to, um, he actually built tablet press machines for decades. And so he's got, um, you know, kind of the, that similar, like the tablet press machine is going to make those tablets and then they've got to go somewhere. Right. So, um, I don't know if he mentioned that specifically, uh, about the, the pharmaceutical, um, tie in, but there's the, the main problem right now, um, for, uh, things like those, um, sifting machines 
is the um, uh, pure cost of them. Uh, they're insanely expensive. Um, but we're going to see if we can mock something up. He's got an idea with a couple, couple changes. And, you know, I, I asked him, okay, what's that going to cost? Right. Cause like from a small farm perspective, he, everything I've done up to this point has been incremental steps. Right. And so I don't want to go from where I'm at now to having to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a machine. That's a huge leap. Right. And so, uh, he said, no, it would just be simple water jet parts um, and some um, machinery from, you know, a local hardware store. So we'll see what we can put together. And I, I'll be posting it, 100% posting it. So 240 pounds of carrots a week right now. Oh, my gosh. 1,200 pounds of potatoes per feeding. Oh, 1,200. I, I assume 1,200, 120. 240 pounds of carrots. That's a lot of, of carrots. Very expensive. I tried one which was good for sifting, but costs twelve thousand. Yes, they're they're just insane, just insane. They work well, but it's it's just too big of a, a of a leap. Um, one of the things I really want to try to do is to be able to build a model that, you know, like I, I don't want to buy one of the machines from uh, outside the U.S. because if I need help fixing it, I, I don't know how to fix it. I'm not a mechanical type person. I'm a DIYer, right? I can use, you know, a drill and screwdriver and things like that. And, but I can't fix stuff like that and artificial intelligence and software. And that's just too much. Um, I, I feel like there can be some, you know, straightforward ways to facilitate what we need to do and, and uh, get things done. Cause I think from a U.S. perspective, labor is one of the biggest drawbacks right now, uh, the labor cost. Um, and so that's where, you know, I'm focused on trying to get some of the processes built um, so that we can take care of some of that, keep us all cranking. I skip a couple days a week so I can buy with 600 pounds a week. Man, you're keeping some potato folks happy up there. 15 pounds of carrot a week right now. Yeah, the, there was a time, Felicia, where I think I only used like two potatoes a week. Uh, when I first started for chickens, I remember I got a thousand mealworms off of Amazon. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And... I think I went through one potato a week, uh, and now it's a whole, whole different story. So what are you guys going to try to do from a feed perspective, um, different alternate ideas? One of the things I'm thinking about uh, is food waste um, from uh, things like uh, well, my, my friend here who makes the sauerkraut, um, he also makes kimchi. They're going to make some of that Friday, and they're going to have a bunch of leftovers from that. Uh, and it's an all-organic farm. So um, my only concern is insects coming in off of those. Uh, but I just pop them in the deep freezer here behind me and take them out later and throw them in. I'm curious if you guys are using any, have any sort of, sort of options or anything that uh, that you might be using or interested in using offset some of the cost of some of that and also potential supply issues as well. So Felicia, I'm going through five pounds feeding per day, three times Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yep. Same thing. We're feeding Monday, Wednesday, Friday too. It seems to work well. When you state the pounds, is it for the entire farm? I use 60 kilogram potatoes per week only for the beetles. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think, I think Max is doing that for the entire farm. Booker groceries have a bunch of publics in the area that throw it. Yes. However, uh, when I went to try to do that, um, hey Ben, I'm live on the book of faces. Oh, yeah. Um, when I went to a couple local, local grocery stores to inquire about that, everyone said no. And when I asked like, what do you do with them? Well, we throw them away. They won't even give them away. Um, they won't even let somebody buy them at a discount, uh, because they've been sued in the past. So, uh, I tried a bunch of different grocery stores and they all said no. Um, so I'm just curious to see how, uh, like some local restaurants potentially, um, where it might be beneficial for somebody to take some of their food waste. Um, that might be a better, better, uh, option for me anyway. The local grocery store here told me, um, they used to give their all their leftover bread uh, and and produce to a pig farmer, and the pig farmer would take it 
you know, take it off their hands basically, so they didn't have to pay to dispose it. Uh, and he would take it and feed it to his pigs for free. He was getting free produce and free bread. And then something happened to his pigs, and he sued the company. So there went that. <sighs> All right. Is freezing carrots, potatoes, etc. okay if I'm feeding the mealworms to small lizards' pets? Yes. Let me think about that. So you're going to freeze them, Richard. Um, I don't think that's a problem. You just, like, anytime you take something out of the freezer after it's been frozen, it's going to be potentially mushy, right? But you take that and feed that to your mealworms, they're going to, they'll be able to process that just fine. If you have any food pantries, they also end up getting a bunch of leftover veggies that they don't end up giving away if you end up having supply issues. That's actually where uh, one of the places directed me to because, oddly enough, they wouldn't let me buy any of it, even the stuff they were wasting, but one of the local food shelters picked up once a week. And so um, I was going to go talk to them. I'm trying to remember why I never did that. It might have been because this, this place got into full swing, and so then I was in construction mode. Uh, but that's one of the things to, it's a lead somewhere in my notebook uh, to revisit at some point. How much do you guys pay per kilogram of carrots and potatoes in the U.S.? Uh, you're going to have to help me with the, the um, transition from pounds to kilograms. I think it's 2.2 pounds equals 1 kilogram. So I can get 10 pounds of potatoes for, I want to say, 5 or $6. I usually buy them in bulk bulk meaning like 10 bags of 10 pounds when they're about half price so it can it comes down to like 20 or 30 cents a pound for potatoes for me carrots are yeah much more expensive um so that would be six u.s dollars for 10 pounds which would be 22 kilograms am i doing the math here right I'm not in front of my computer to boop, boop, boop. I have been known to mess up centimeters and millimeters on, I think, the first live we ever did here. So uh, definitely double check some of that math. Um, but the the food prices, it's interesting because it's human-grade food, which is one, not problem, but impact. If you can get food that is um, for feed, then it's going to be a little bit cheaper. Uh, and in some cases, very you know a lot cheaper. The problem is you have to buy tons of it because it's people feeding it to pigs and poultry and all sorts of stuff. So three forty-eight for five pounds of carrots. Yep, that's not bad. Two point two pounds per kilogram. Ah, I remembered. I'm trying to remember why I I knew that. Um, I think it's frass related. I feel like it's frass related. It'll come to me. Talk to farmers that give away free less than perfect vegetables. They can't sell farmers markets also. Yes. So I'm Richard. That's an awesome suggestion. Um, and I'm going to try to, to put that in my memory banks. Cause one of the things I'm looking at is, uh, selling at my local farmer's market, uh, selling the live insects, uh, for, for, you know, feed, same thing, reptiles, birds, things like that. Um, but also selling the frass, I think in a farmer's market, uh, that might be a very good opportunity to get the word out, do some, you know, grassroots type, uh, marketing. Um, and so, you know, just building the network with, with folks to say, like with my friend here, who's making kimchi Friday, he's going to have all sorts of good leftovers that are 100% organic and he doesn't need them. He's just going to put them in the compost pile, which is literally like at the front of this building. So, um, it's working out great there. It's a matter of timing and picking it up, right? You want to make sure you've got, you've got the, the ability to deal with the, the amount you're going to get. Da -da. Drew, everyone's prices are going to vary widely based on reason. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yellow clips, too. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's what I missed. Ba -ba. All right. We're doing good on time. Ten minutes left. Good stuff, guys. I keep just keep seeing movement out there, the wind blowing and stuff, so I get distracted easily. 
All right. What other questions do you guys have? Anything, anything else going on? Uh, so with 10 minutes left, like we'll, we'll keep going. Um, no pressure to, to jump in or anything. Um, and then uh, I'll get another one of these scheduled for next week. I'm trying to vary the times um, and the days uh, so that we can get folks from all over because our, our um, Facebook community is, is pretty varied as far as where everyone's located. So uh, just trying to get everyone squared away and get an opportunity. Does the U.S. for insect, does the U.S. for insect based pet food have a market? Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with Drew. Uh, it's, it's starting, it, like, Drew, wasn't there a, like a cat or a dog food, I feel like, was, uh, was marketing and promoting that they had some insect protein, but it's not like, mainstream at all at all um i think personally from a u.s market perspective uh insect protein both for feed and food uh is going to be more of a behind the scenes type thing uh and what i mean by that is um you know let's say a fast food chain that uh, has burgers that are made of meat right Maybe they're like half soy instead of meat. Um, I, I have a feeling that depending on what the cost structures of all that end up being and the scale of production, once insect scale uh, or insect production scales up um, and the economics make more sense to get protein uh, from the insect as opposed to soybean or, or some other uh, product, um, what you'll see is that they'll start putting that in and not say like come buy our insect burger it's just come come get the cheeseburger um i just don't feel like the u.s consumers are all that concerned um about what's actually in the food that they're buying at some of those places so can't remember the woman that owned the mealworm farm they've been trying to get into pet food yes pet food's probably a a good you know place to go because the u.s sentiment about eating insects is not like yum i want to eat more um and so that's why i don't think you know, mainstream is not going to be like whole insects, um, alive or dead. Uh, they're going to um, uh, try to get it into pet feed uh, and say, you know, it's the it's the natural thing. Your animals do it anyway. I mean, we've all seen barn cats out jumping on grasshoppers and eating them. It's a natural thing. Chickens go bonkers over it, that sort of thing. So we'll get there. Um, Drew, I see that, co that comment there. Lazar, give me a sec. Drew, Yord Producers, I believe is their name. Yes. I don't know if Yord was trying to get into pet food or not. They, they might have been, um, but they are no longer Yord Producers. So, uh, Lazar, how often do you change beetles trays and for how many weeks do you keep them? Uh, so I'll start with the second part of that. I keep them for two months, eight weeks, um, after they're harvested uh, from our fresh beetle collection area. So, they could be, um, so we do that every Tuesday and Friday, and we do beetles once a week now. So they could be like four or five days old when they get into a tray. Um, so they could end up being two, two months and half a week, eight and a half, nine weeks old. Um, but we keep them around that long because they, they're going to lay 90 five percent it's something astronomical they're going to lay most of their eggs um in in a good in, in a good environment conditions they'll lay most of their eggs within the first two months um and so after that from a farming perspective from you know i'm, I'm raising these for the insects and that's the revenue stream it doesn't make economical sense to keep them around for their entire lifespan uh, which could be months m longer than two um, so we call them at two months um, ben actually feeds them to his chickens. Like they're a good nutrient source. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, but from a farming perspective, we just don't keep them. Uh, but we'll use them for chickens. And right now, the, the amount we're producing, Ben can take them to his chickens and they gobble them up, right? Um, and they're a good nutrient source. Uh, it's a wonderful way to, to take care of them. Um, and then um, we changed those beetle trays. So we were doing it every two weeks. Uh, and then our situation changed because now we have a dedicated facility. Um, we have me 100% here. I was actually working two jobs up until about six or six or eight months ago. Um, and so now we are going to do it every week, once a week. And then there's actually some data that shows um, the, that the um, 
scale of when they lay and how productive they are over time actually changes and it might be um, better to do things like maybe at the beginning do it every three four days and then taper it down to once a week as the bin is older. Um, so I need to go back and look at some of that literature and, and see that that's a lot of work though. Um, and so once a week is fine. We were doing it uh, twice a week for war. We started in 20, I started this thing in 2017. So up until 2021, we were doing it every two weeks and producing and selling as a business. So, um, uh, op there's a difference between optimal and what actually works for you. So, um, let me, I'm just scrolling back here. No producers, I didn't know that. Yep, we call it two months as well. We only use our mealworms for dog treats. Hmm. We sell our beetles to local chicken farm for cheap. Yeah, chicken farm. How trays are you maintaining, Justin? Uh, I want to say we have... I have 1,100 of these blue trays. This one's dirty, he's sitting next to me. It's over by our new cleaning station. Um, I have 1,100 of those, and I want to say we only have like six or 700 in rotation right now, uh, but that was a limitation from the old building max. We, could, we couldn't jam any more in there. And so now we've got the, um, the space for it, and we're just gonna start ramping. Uh, we actually started holding back more um, of the harvested worms instead of listing them to sell them. Uh, we're holding a lot of those, uh, a lot more of those back, double and triple in some cases of what we did before uh, to get more pupa and get more beetles and start ramping things up. Um, what I do is nine weeks and 10, I merge two trays on in one. So that, uh, Velazar, that's um, an interesting idea. You're still gonna have um, a, a scenario where like that bin is not gonna produce as many eggs. And so you might need to keep that bin for like a month in that, uh, at that stage to get the same amount of eggs as a regular tray that you have producing uh, and changing every week. Um, that's, that's where it really comes down to from a space perspective and do you want to keep track of those bins? You know, it's more work for you to keep track of them and feed them for that month or whatever long it is, right? I'm just, I'm kind of guesstimating there. Um, but uh, from a cost benefit ratio, it may not be, may not be good. We are our trays once a week on Mondays. Uh, I do all my orders on Mondays, so that's a pretty busy day for me. Um, we've been aiming for like Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, but that was really because in the old facility, we couldn't have more than one to two people working, um, at one time. So, uh, try all that makes no difference in different sizes. Just add more work and more trays. That's potential. Yep. Uh, da, da, da. I think, I think I'm answering all the questions. So I don't think I said this before. We, we got a couple minutes left, but I don't think I said it before. On the last live, I was missing some comments. So if you've asked a question and I conveniently missed it and didn't reply, um, please let me know because it it uh, I'm trying to answer every question that's up here. But last time it was missing some for some reason. What's the size of your new building? It is 2,100 square feet. Uh, we are 30 feet wide and 70 feet long, um, which feels really long like when we were we were talking about we myself and and um my friend who uh built the place um we we were looking at it and 30 feet in the u.s is as wide as you can go before you have to use an uh, like double the amount of wood if we wanted to go to 35 feet the cost of the the gables up here um would have been astronomical and so it was the it was like the most you know the, the widest width we could go, and then from a physical layout perspective of the land that we're on, um, if we went further than seventy feet, uh, we butted right up as close as we could um, to the property line between myself and him, um, and if we went out further, uh, it would be you know running into um, the the landscape and the hill and whatnot, a lot more dirt work to fix it. So those dimensions are a hundred percent based on the physical location I'm in, not. I wanted 30 feet wide for, you know, 17 of these trays to fit in. Uh, I, I didn't do it like that just because, you know, it, it made more sense to kind of build it the max size we could, and then I'd just make it fit however. Um, and then within that 2,100 square feet, 1,100 is the insect room. 
And so there's a giant wall right behind me here. So that's the door that goes into the insect room. And so this, there's a big wall here um, behind the frass dispenser. All that over, there's a wall there that goes across and basically cuts the whole building in half. Um, and so that's where the, all the temperature control is. Uh, it stays 78-ish degrees. Um, it's been running a little low at like 76, but that's just me trying to figure things out. Um, and then out here, it's open uh, from a funding perspective. Um, I wanted to get everything set and squared in there, keep the cushion from a, a monetary perspective in case something else happens. So I haven't insulated anything out here yet. Uh, Long-term plan though, that's what we'll do because this is our processing area from a FRAS perspective. Um, this is where we have all of our team meetings. The office is over here. Um, and so eventually everything in here is going to be as well once the, once the money is available. But um, it's low on the list. I have too many projects and ideas and things I want to do before, uh, before that. Uh, it's probably going to take one winter of me freezing my butt off out here um, to, to motivate me to to spend the money to insulate things. So, all right, let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Da, da, da. Thank you for the meeting, appreciate it. Yes, thank you guys for coming. Um, so, sorry. Um, the the goal of this is to try to provide as much value for you guys in the community as possible. And so, getting folks in here answering questions is fantastic. Paul, Drew, I'm talking to you guys. Um, asking questions too, um, Joan and Tammy throwing those questions out. Uh, really appreciate you guys jumping in. Continue um, doing that with the community and supporting the folks that jump in. That's exactly what we want and what we need. Uh, I'll get more of these out there, so I'm going to wrap things up for the day uh, here, but we'll get another one of these scheduled. Um, and if you guys have any questions or anything you want to hit at that time, feel free to comment on the invite uh, that's going to be posted or message me directly, post it wherever you want to, um, and I'll keep track of that and uh, bring that up. Uh, if you guys need anything, feel free to ask, and thank you all so much for coming. appreciate it. Have a good one.